Good evening, one and all. I welcome you all in International Lecture Series 26. Today we have our instructor, Dr. Tim Thompson, who is a professor of Applied Biological Anthropology and Associate Dean Academics in the School of Health and Life Sciences. I welcome you all along with my co-host, Dr. Pooja Chakravarti in this session. We welcome Tim uh, for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk a much required talk on the topic, hot mess understanding heat induced changes in bone and embracing in bioarchaeology of cremations. I welcome on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, I request my co-host Dr. Pooja to read about our esteemed speaker. So give the brief introduction about our esteemed speaker. Dr. Pooja, over to you. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tim, for joining us today. Tim Thompson is a professor of Applied Biological Anthropology and Associate Dean Academic in the School of Health and Life Sciences. In 2014, Tim was awarded a prestigious National Teaching Fellowship by Higher Education Academy for Excellence in Teaching and Support for Learning in Higher Education. Before coming to TSEC, Tim studied for his PhD at the University of Sheffield Faculty of Medicine and was a lecturer in Forensic Anthropology and at the University of Dundee. Tim has published over 70 papers in peer-reviewed journals and books and is a renowned expert on heat-induced changes in the bone. His latest book is Human Remains, Another Dimension, the Application of Imaging to the Study of Human Remains. Prior to this, he published the book, The Archaeology of Cremation, Burned Human Remains in Funerary Studies, and was co-author of Human Identity and Identification with Dr. Rebecca Golan, Durham University, and senior editor for the book, Forensic Human Identification. Tim is on the editorial board for the Journal of Forensic Sciences, Forensic Anthropology, and Human Remains, and Violence. Interdisciplinary Journal. He served as Editor-in-Chief of the journal Science and Justice for three years and currently has the role that uh, role for the Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine. He is also a fellow of the Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences, the Royal Anthropological Institute, the Royal Society of Biology, and is an honorary fellow of the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine. He is also a senior fellow of the Advanced Team is a practicing forensic anthropologist who has worked at home and abroad in a variety of forensic contexts. Thank you, Dr. Puya Chakravarti, for giving the introduction about our esteemed speaker. Uh, I'm thankful, uh, Tim Thompson, for accepting our invitation. Now I request our esteemed speaker, Tim Thompson, to take over the session. Over to you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to talk uh, today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, burnt bone and this, the study of cremated material. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the context of uh, burnt bone and the context of studying cremations. We'll have a little look at some of the changes that bone goes through when it's burned. We'll have a look at some of the methods that we can use to study burnt bone, and then we are going to have a look at some examples um, at the end as well, which I hope will put all of this into a bit of context. Um, the study of burnt bone is very, is very broad. There's, there's a lot that we could talk about, and obviously we don't have the time to do that. So this is a fairly um, whistle-stop tour. It's a fairly fast whiz through some of these issues and areas that I think are of interest. Um, but if anyone has any questions or wants any further information, then um, people are very welcome to email me or contact me afterwards. I'll be happy to uh, talk through a bit more. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to have a look at is just, I think, understand a little bit more about um, that, why people study burnt bone, why it's important, but also why... Um, it's perhaps falling behind a bit in terms of the study of osteology and, and other areas of, um, of, 
of bone. Now, partly this is because it's a very challenging material to study. And there have been over the years and over the past decades, there has been this view that burnt bone cannot tell you anything. You can't learn anything about people uh, from burnt bone. You can't do any identification or any profiling because the material is too small, it's too fragmented, and it's changed too much. And I like this, um, I'm just gonna scooch over a second. I like this quote here from the 1930s. It's, you know, guys, 90 years old now. But um, here we have an eminent uh, professor explaining why there's no point in studying uh, burp bone, why you can't take anything out of this. And even though this is a very old perspective and a really old view on the subject, just a couple of years ago, I had a similar sorts of view uh, given to me uh, in one of the grant application that I sent through. And um, this was the feedback that we had from our application. And there was a questioning of the methods that we were using, questioning the, the whether or not we can get information out of burnt bone. Uh, and, you know, again, really just continuing that idea from the 1930s that burnt bone doesn't tell you anything. Now, this is all wrong. This is absolutely wrong. And there have been lots of studies over recent years which have demonstrated that you can get exactly the same amount of information from burnt bone as you can get from unburnt bone or buried bone. It is more challenging, it's harder to do, but you can get that information. So this view that we're seeing here is very antiquated uh, for, for people like me that study burnt bone. However, uh, we still see it permeating through the, um, the discipline of archaeology and forensic sciences as well. And the thing about burnt bone, though, is that it appears in many, many different contexts. So the study of burnt bone isn't the study of something which we hardly ever see. It's not some uh, small, tiny aspect of archaeology or some minuscule aspect of forensic science. It's very common. We see burnt material from plane crashes and car crashes, from house fires. We see it from um, uh, attempts to you know, cover up murders or hide kind of forensic evidence. We see it in terms of the archaeological context and funerary patterns. We see it in modern funerary contexts uh, as well. So there are a huge number of contexts. And in the UK alone, um, there's something like 20,000 unstudied cremated bone contexts uh, that we still have to look at. So this is a huge um, area of work. But there has been very little uh, work done in it. When we think about the amount of work that, that goes into forensic anthropology generally or archaeology generally in terms of the focus on the skeleton, only a very small amount of that uh, focuses on burnt bone. And here, what I've done is I've just clustered together some key themes um, in terms of how the subject has developed over the years. And we can see that in pre-1980s, the um, the study of burnt bone was really just about looking at interesting archaeological contexts that archaeologists had excavated, were working through, and uh, were noting interesting features that they'd seen. So they were noticing um, the colour change, they were noticing uh, fracture patterns and those sorts of things. Then we move into the 1980s and we start seeing some more experimental studies, people wanting to understand why we were seeing that color change, why we were seeing fracturing in the way that, that we were seeing it, and, and why those archaeological contexts in particular were displaying the features that they were. So we had a number of uh, experimental studies, but I called them actualistic experimental studies because what people like to do were put uh, bodies or, or uh, animal analogs on pyres, on, on bonfires, and burn them that way and to see what happened. And the thinking there is always that um, it's more realistic. You know, if, if we can put the body on a, on a pyre, it's more realistic in terms of what we would actually see in the archaeological or forensic context. But the problem with that, though, um, is that you don't get to control any of the variables. Um, you don't get to, when you look at your, the results of those actualistic studies, it's really hard to know whether the fracturing that you're seeing is uh, the result of the temperature or the, the way in which you built the pyre or the weather or the soft tissues. And as we get into the 1990s and the uh, 2000s, we start seeing more lab-based experimental studies, studies um, where 
researchers have focused on just one particular element of that um, uh, milieu of change that we see uh, on burnt bone. And so we move away then from, from this actualistic studies into something which you know, some people have criticized for being um, not being realistic, for being very fake in terms of, of how it is. But the advantage for me, I mean, I'm, I'm very much for that experimental approach. The advantage for me is that it allows you to control those variables and you can really understand the impact of any one particular variable. And then you draw those studies together to understand uh, holistically what's happening. Then as we move through into um, sort of the mid noughties all the way through to, to where we are now, what we're seeing is an increase in microscopic analysis of burn bone. So that, ex that experimental philosophy is still there, but the equipment that we have to do those studies is vastly improving. And that's simply a, a consequence of just you know, the development of scientific method. But it's also a consequence, I think, of um, a more collaborative approach to experimental research. So we're seeing forensic scientists, archaeologists working more with people from a chemistry background or a biology background or a um, geology background. Uh, and we're also seeing greater accessibility of these analytical methods as well. Um, more of these um, advanced analytical uh, pieces of kits are making their ways into standard laboratories, and particularly in the university settings where we have, you know, the, the, the equipment that we have in our lab now is far superior to the equipment that we had in the lab when I was studying the subject as an undergrad. And that's just, uh, and that has allowed us then to um, become increasingly nuanced in our studies. What we're also seeing uh, is a development of a number of these review commentaries. We've got to the stage now where we have finally, you know, from the mid eighties up to now, a substantial body of knowledge. We understand what bone does when it burns. We understand what the human body does when it burns. And now people are pausing and reflecting upon the work that has been done, drawing all this, uh, these studies together and allowing us a fuller understanding of what's happening to the body. And that's really interesting because what we're then doing is using those review studies as a springboard for further um, research. And it's a very timely thing to do. So hopefully what we can see then from this is this development of uh, the study in burnt bone. And it's important, I think, just to appreciate that because it helps us understand why we're doing what we're doing now. But it also underlines the fact that people have really only been studying burnt bone in a systematic and um, purposeful way for about 20, 25 years, something like that. So it's not very long at all when we think about how long people have been studying the skeleton uh, more, more broadly. And as I was putting this, this kind of presentation together and I kind of realized I started studying burnt bone in 1999, um, which was um, when I was doing my master's in Bradford and I did it for uh, my project. And that was the, um, in fact, it was, I can remember, remember exactly where I was. I was in the library when I was searching for um, a journal article to do for my journal review assessment and I came across uh, a paper which was talking about the challenges of identifying bodies from plane crashes and that is what kind of stimulated my interest in understanding uh, what happens to bone and bodies when it, when it burns and I realized now that I've been studying burnt bone probably <laughs> for certainly for some of the students that will be watching this from before they were born and that is a very sobering and quite pressing thought. Okay, so that then has put it in a little bit of context. It's a subject which uh, no one really cares about because it's quite challenging, but we're seeing an exponential increase in research over the past 20 years, particularly over the past five to 10 years. So now we're going to have a quick look at some of the heat induced changes that we see. What happens to bone when it burns? So we have four stages of uh, transformation. Uh, and these four stages were really first described by uh, a forensic anthropologist out of Canada called Pamela Main Karaya. And then we did a bit of work and, and revised them uh, a number of years later. But what we can see are those four stages the, um, through which bone will go. Uh, and we have dehydration, uh, which is the first, which is when the water is removed. Decomposition is when the um, organic material is removed. The inversion stage is when we start seeing a change in that chemical structure of the bone. And then the fusion stage is when we start to see a transformation of the crystal structure of the bone. 
we can see some rough temperature um, ranges with each of these four stages. But um, I think the key things to take away from this diagram are that the as you work your way up those four stages from dehydration up to fusion, we start seeing an increasing amount of change to the bone. So the fusion is the most transformative stage um, as a result of burning. We also see that that starts at about 700 degrees, which is roughly the average temperature of a, of a house fire. So again, this fusion stage, this most transformative stage, is something that we would expect to see in a routine fire. The other thing to bear in mind is that these are not discrete changes. So it's entirely possible for a single skeleton or even a single bone from a single skeleton to be exhibiting the changes in each of these four phases at the same time. Um, and they all have a slightly different impact on our ability to do our anthropological assessments. But we're gonna come back to those a little bit later. The fusion is the key stage. That's the one where we're seeing the crystal structure uh, of the bone change. We start seeing the crystals fuse and coalesce together. Uh, we see a transformation from small, uh, poorly ordered crystals to very large, well-ordered uh, crystals. We see a, a transformation in that uh, crystal structure. So it almost becomes a pure form of, hydro of hydroxyapatite, which is the, the composition of bone. It becomes, as the bone works its way through that fusion stage, more like a ceramic. And it sounds like a ceramic as well um, when you kind of tap it against something. Color change is one of the, the kind of key areas of interest for people um, who are looking at burnt bone because it's the most obvious. Bone goes from its natural kind of tanny, bony color all the way through to um, dark grays, blacks, light grays, and whites as it goes. And it works its way up through that kind of color index. Um, through those four phases of, of um, transformation. And really the bone would expect to get to that kind of white phase when it hits that fusion uh, stage there. And so that's, if bone has turned a very pure white and sometimes there's hints of turquoise or pink in there as well, that's when we would uh, assume that it is it's, the bone has worked its way through all those four stages. We're gonna come back to color change because it's an important uh, area for study. So what else happens? Well, the surface of the bone changes as well. We've got some images here from scanning electron microscopy, um, and we can see the surface of bone at different temperatures. And again, we can see this transformation um, as the heating intensity uh, increases. We see the increase in fractures and cracking uh, and flaking away of the bone surface as the bone uh, increases in its um, through its intensity of burning. But then once we get to 700 degrees, eight, 900 degrees, if that uh, fusion stage starts, what we start seeing then is a transformation of uh, that surface. And it looks less like normal bone, like you can see in that 100 uh, degrees category, and a little bit more like it's, um, it's been described as like a lava flow or looking like the moon surface uh, in, in different papers, but you can see how it's transformed. Um, the number of pores decreases, it becomes a bit smoother, you lose those fractures that have been developing over time and over that intensity of burning. And really, the way that you can kind of think about this happening is it's because the uh, fusion phase of the bone has started, those crystals are becoming, uh, well, the, the crystal structure is becoming mobile, it's becoming fluid, it's not, not really, but you can kind of think of it that way. And then um, the bone is restructuring and reordering as a consequence of that. So we also see warping and we see fracturing uh, as well. So the warping is interesting because not every bone that's burnt bends. Uh, we only see it in a few examples. And there's been a lot of interest in the literature as, as to what causes bones to uh, bend. Um, some people have argued that it's to do with the, in, the expansion of the air within the bone uh, as a consequence of the heat causing it to bend. I don't, I don't really believe that. I don't think that's the case. Um, bone is not, bone is porous, the air gets in and out. So I don't think actually expanding the air inside will have that significant effect. Um, some people have argued that it's to do with the collagen uh, in the bone contracting as the um, 
bone heats up. But again, I'm not entirely convinced that the, the collagen is strong enough to, to bend bone that way. For me, I think what is a more likely cause for bone bending is as the bone heats up and it works its way into, again, into that fusion stage where it becomes quite malleable, then the weight of the body or other objects around it causes the bone to bend uh, as it goes through. I think that kind of makes some sense. The fracturing is interesting though. And again, we see different sorts of fractures depending on the, the uh, context of burning. And here we've got uh, some really nice U-shaped fractures on this piece of bone. We see these fractures develop as a consequence of the contraction of the muscle tissues as a consequence of, of the burning. And so you can get a sense of directionality uh, and timing as well from uh, these fractures. What's really interesting though, is that we see these U-shaped fractures like in this diagram here, uh, in bone that's burnt with soft tissue on. So bone that's burnt dry, there's been a period of decomposition, doesn't show these sorts of U-shaped fractures. We get instead a linear rectangular grid like pattern of fractures across the bone. And that's a really useful rule of thumb uh, for differentiating the two types of bone. It doesn't, it's not true in all cases. We have done some work to show that you can still get some U-shaped fractures in some bones that have gone through a period of decomposition, but we think that's still happening because the collagen is still present in the bone. So, here we have um, a figure which, where we've attempted to draw together some of these heat-induced uh, changes. We can see color change and loss of weight and fractures and porosity changes and, and all sorts. When you look at the academic literature uh, and the research in this particular area, what you tend to see are lots of papers that focus on things like color change or weight loss, you know, or even fracture patterns and fragmentation. And those are interesting papers and they're useful in themselves, but actually, they're not really telling you anything about the process in, of, through which the bone is going as a consequence of burning, because those sorts of features are actually the consequence of other changes that are going on in the bone. So if we think about uh, color change and uh, porosity change, for example, or, or color change and weight loss, those are the consequence of the loss of the organic material going through the bone. If we think about dimensional change, the fact that bone shrinks uh, as um, as it burns at high intensities, and it can shrink by you know up to 25, 30 percent depending on the intensity and the conditions of the burning. Well, that uh, is linked to the change in the inorganic uh, component of the bone. So what we've done here is we've clustered these changes together to show the relationships between them. And fundamentally, what this shows is that it leads us to two key changes within the bone as a consequence of burning: the loss of the organic material that then causes a number of changes, and the um, change in the crystal structure of the bone, which causes another set of changes. And so we have designated those two, the organic loss of the organic material and the inorganic change, the primary level changes, and the examples that we see on the screen here are secondary level changes. Now for me, um, although these are really interesting, uh, these secondary level changes that we can see on the screen, I'm more interested in the primary level changes because for me, they explain the secondary. And much of my research uh, since doing this particular uh, piece of work has focused on looking at the inorganic component of bone. How does that change over time? Uh, sorry, how does that change over bur through burning? And how does that affect our methods of anthropology and so on as we go forward? Now, why should we care? Who cares about burnt bone? Why should we care about heat induced uh, change? Well, very simply, because every one of those primary and secondary level changes that we've just had a look at will cause an impact on our ability to accurately create an osteoprofile of a skeleton that's gone through a period of burning. So all of our methods, our metric and our morphological methods uh, that we might want to use, some of our biomolecular methods as well, will all be impacted by heat-induced change. So we can't ignore it because whenever we do an, an osteoprofile on burnt bone, we, we are introducing inaccuracies in a way that we wouldn't if the bone was unburnt. And so um, it's really important that we understand these sorts of changes and what causes them and how they influence and how they manifest, because it helps us then to interpret um, our anthropological profiling when we do that on burnt material. So it is actually really important that we study this. And people are, are, have been realizing this over the past 10 years or so. 
Okay, so we've had a look at the, the context of uh, the study of burnt bone. We've had a look at some of the key changes that bone goes through when it's burned. Now we're just going to have a look at a few different um, methods of uh, analysis that we can that we can use, which is allowing us a greater level of understanding. So I'm going to focus on current, like new development methods, as opposed to some of the older traditional methods that people have been using. We're going to start with just thinking about imaging. So there have been a, there's been a real increase in accessibility of different imaging methods, and those are being applied really nicely to burnt material. So we've applied some uh, surface scanning methods, some of our structured light methods, we've applied to burnt bone quite nicely. Uh, when we're trying to reconstruct fragments of uh, burnt bone, you can scan each portion and knit it back together again in uh, 3D space. But uh, here we have an example from uh, Lisa Harvig's work where they have used micro CT to scan, um, in this case, archaeological urns from Denmark to have a look at the contents inside. And you can see the urn uh, on uh, the left-hand side, and you can see the, the CT scan on the right-hand side. And those are white things that you can see, that's bone inside uh, the material here. And so what this scanning has allowed us to do is it allows us to get a much better sense of the condition of the material because you can spot heat-induced change from these CT scans. You can see the fracture patterns and so on. But it also gives you a really good uh, sense of the position of the body in the urns or in the containers uh, that you might be interested in here. Um, subsequent work has demonstrated that the act of excavating this material out of the urns increases fragmentation. So it's much better to do a scan like this first before you start that process um, so you can get a sense of the undisturbed uh, skeletal uh, remains in there. This has also been applied to uh, burnt, uh, burnt bone in forensic context, uh, but there the emphasis has been more on using MRI, um, but that's actually that's okay for looking at whole bodies with soft tissue. MRI is not great for looking at bone, particularly burnt bone. Uh, CT is much more effective for looking at uh, burnt bone. So there's some scope then in, in exploring these new imaging modalities that we have access to. This is another paper that uh, I quite like, and, and this is from Kutura, and they have uh, they had a context in the United Arab Emirates where they were had recovered a collection of burnt material, and they weren't sure if it was uh, human or if it was uh, animal material. And so they used um, histological slicing and then imaging through that to make a, a conclusion as to whether or not this is human material or animal and you can see the material the fragments that they were dealing with on the left hand side you can see the histological slices taking histological slices out of burnt bone is actually very challenging because the bone is quite fragile when the bone goes through that um, dehydration and then the decomposition phase the bone becomes very porous and very delicate and fragile and it's very likely to fall apart then uh, as you co collect your uh, histological slices so you have to embed the material quite carefully but you can see some lovely images uh, thin sections on, on the right-hand side, and they were able to use this imaging method to uh, conclude that this was human, these were human remains. And so they were able to then conclude that this particular cave deposit that they had uh, demonstrated uh, some of the earliest examples of cremation in this particular part uh, of the world. There's also been uh, an increased interest in the use of stable isotopes. Now, for many years, people have assumed that you can't do stable isotopic analysis on burnt bone because uh, the process of burning, um, because of the impact on the crystal structure and the chemical structure of the bone, it messes up the carbon and oxygen isotope ratios and uh, make, makes them redundant for the use of looking at things like diet and migration and so forth. But there's been some great work uh, over the past few years um, focusing on strontium as a method for um, stable isotope analysis. And it seems that strontium isn't affected by the burning process which is fantastic. So we now have a method, uh, and this is an example from uh, Stonehenge uh, in the UK. So we, and we now have a method where we can start looking at diet um, from cremated individuals. And then when we start, can start using diet, we can uh, explore the potential then a little bit for uh, mobility and migration uh, as well. So this is opening up a whole new area of uh, analysis, particularly, as I said, because this is a relatively new method. Uh, it's only really been applied for the past five years or so, if that. Um, and 
we were able then to go back and, and reanalyze a, a number of really important archaeological uh, cremation sites. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't been used on um, forensic cases yet, uh, or at least nothing's been published to, to show that it has, but there's no reason why it can't. So we're going to take a step back to colour change then for a moment, because people have been obsessed for years with the use of uh, colour change as a method for predicting temperature of burning. And I can totally understand why you would do that, because, um, you know, as heating increases, the um, change in colour in bone goes and changes with it. So as we said, it goes from you know, dark greys, blacks, light greys into, into whites. And there is a very loose correlation uh, between uh, the colour of the bone and the temperature of the bone, but it's but there's more to it than that. And actually, what we're seeing is uh, that colour links more usefully with the intensity of burning rather than the temperature of burning. And if we just use the phrase intensity, then it allows us to bring in the whole number of variables that influence colour. So yes, yes, temperature is one of them. But it's also duration and oxygen availability and the use of accelerants, the amount of soft tissue present, and so on and so on and so on. What causes colour change is not temperature, but it's the loss of the organic material. It's the loss of carbon within the bone. Uh, and as the bone uh, goes through dark greys and blacks, that's the carbon being burnt out. And then when it becomes white, the carbon is lost. So um, it does that, that process does link to temperature, but it links to other factors as well. Now here we have uh, an example of uh, some of the work that we have done. So the next few slides really focuses on some of the work that, that we've been doing at, at Teesside over the past few years. Um, even though, I, and I've just said that we really shouldn't be using color change for predicting temperature, I'm still quite interested in using color change for predicting temperature because I think it might be a, a really useful, quick, rough and ready method. But part of the challenge with using color is it's really subjective. So I could say something is a steel blue gray and someone else could look at the same piece of bone and just call it like a dull gray or something. So that, that kind of um, comparing one site to another site, one piece of research to another is very difficult. Now, the, the issue with that is not the bone itself, but it's people. And uh, I often feel that if we can just remove people from some of our scientific methods, things will be easier and smoother. So this is an attempt to do this uh, using color. So what we tried to do was we used a particular method, um, it's actually very, just looking at kind of color light reflectance and absorption to um, make an objective classification of color so people didn't have to talk about it at all. On the left there, you can see us attempting first to put it into 3D color space. That didn't work at all because actually um, most of bone is pretty much the same color. So then we started to look at the spectra uh, from these bones uh, as well. And what we realized was that um, it was possible, if we looked at intensity of bone, not temperature, to cluster um, burnt bone into low, medium, and high intensity burning. And that we could use a method like this to automate this process. And so if you had a piece of burnt material uh, that wasn't that you didn't know uh, if it had been burned or we didn't know what temperature it would be burned through, you could run it through this uh, method and it would tell you. Now, as you might be able to tell from the slide, it didn't quite work the way that we had hoped. Um, here are, and I'm going to give you an example of this, uh, and the challenges of studying colour change. Here are our three average uh, spectra for the different intensities of burning. So this is an average of, uh, of hundreds of pieces of bone fragments that uh, I made my students scan. Um, here we've just got, again, just some blind samples, some examples to show you that it was sort of working. But this is the interesting graph here. So again, we've got the same average curves that we can see in the previous uh, half of the slide. And then the purple white line, that's the new one. And the purple line is an unknown piece of bone uh, that we ran through this method. And really what we were trying to do is get the method to predict which, if that piece of bone had been burnt to a low, medium or high intensity. And you can see on the left-hand side of that spectra as it starts, it, very, it, it mirrors very nicely that middle intensity of, of burning. But then it kind of drops uh, and disappears off the scale. And we spent a little while wondering why this was. Um, and it turned out very simply to be that this piece of bone was uh, still dirty. So the spectra that you're seeing here is actually bone covered in mud. Uh, and the reason that we have this happen is because that this particular piece of bone wasn't cleaned as thoroughly as uh, the others. 
So our conclusion was here that this is not an effective method to use because really what we had done is we'd spent the summer developing a method which was defeated by a dirty piece of bone. And I think that, you know, for me, just underline the fact that using the surface color of bone is actually probably quite problematic for uh, a number of reasons. So that didn't work. So we carried on. So then we thought, right, we can't use uh, color for bone, but maybe we can use something else because it's still quite important to be able to, to correlate the condition of bone with the intensity of burning because that allows you then to make statements about whether or not the bone might have shrunk in size, um, what other sorts of features you might be looking for in that kind of context of death. So we instead focused on crystal structure. And uh, crystal structure has been long used for looking at bone diagenesis um, and the kind of um, uh, the degradation of bone over time. So we use that same method uh, for looking at burnt bone, because really the process of burning mirrors the process of diagenesis, except over a considerably shorter period of time. So we um, did the first few uh, studies, and in fact, I, I might just show you the results of those first. I'm gonna skip ahead a few slides. So we ran those these traditional uh, crystallinity measures, um, and really it requires you to use an FTIR and uh, record a couple of features on the peaks of the bones, and then you create, use an index of indices to uh, calculate a value called the crystallinity index. We did that very successfully. We were very pleased with ourselves. Uh, and then we uh, applied it on some blind samples. And you can see the results of our blind samples here, where if you look at the uh, blue squares, those are probably the most accurate uh, predictions that we had. And the yellow triangles are the actual temperatures of the bone. And if you look at the results that we see here out of these 10 samples, what you can see is that we were right twice out of 10 times. Uh, so we had a 20% success rate, which uh, I'm sure you'd agree is pretty bad. Now, we were not put off by this um, because in theory, this method should be reliable and more robust than color, partly because it takes more energy and effort from the fire to make those changes happen. So we went back to the drawing board a little bit and um, we went back to this. And what we can see here on this uh, graph are the FTIR spectra uh, from thousands of pieces of experiment experimentally burnt bone. And you can see the temperature of burning down the side, and you can see the spectra that the FTIR uh, produces. Now, when we use just uh, the crystallinity index, actually all we're using out of these 2,000 pieces of data per spectra, we use three. Um, sitting around about the 600 mark uh, for our prediction. Now, when you look at these graphs, and really what these graphs are showing is how the spectra changes as the intensity of burning changes. You see uh, that around about that 600, actually there's very little change at all. But where there's a lot of change, it's around the 900 mark uh, and around the 1,400 to 1,800 mark. And here we're seeing a lot of heat-induced change in the spectra, which means that there's a lot of change in the crystal composition of the bone, because this is what this method is looking at. So we went back to the drawing board. We created new methods of analysis that were looking at the most active parts of the spectra, as opposed to the most, some of the, the kind of the most consistent parts of the spectrum. And um, I'll come back to that graph. Um, and here we have then our seven new crystallinity indices measures. The CI that you can see there, that's the traditional one that we used that didn't work very well. The other six are new ones that we created based on the spectra. And in the table there, you can see um, in the square brackets, that's just the accuracy, just using the um, crystallinity index measure on its own, the first traditional one that everyone uses, and the values outside of the square brackets are our measures using a combination of all seven of these new measures. And what you can see, if you look at the proportion of correct uh, values, uh, particularly as you run along uh, the bottom there, is that we had a very good accuracy. We were right in our blind testing predictions of temperature and intensity of burning almost 100% of the time. And this isn't due to some fantastic, like, you know, methodological development on our part. It's very simply just because we were looking at what parts of the crystal structure are actually changing and measuring those changes. Now, this is important because we are then going to use this method in some of our uh, examples in a couple of minutes. And I'm just going to jump back to 
this slide here uh, to show you that there is a correlation between the, the uh, change in crystal uh, structure and uh, intensity and temperature of burning there. And we can see that we have a curvilinear line running up of these data points here. And these are collections of different studies that we trawl through the literature for. Uh, and what this does is that it allows us then, because there are these differences in these crystal structures over different temperatures, it allows us to make these crude predictions that we were talking about. We've subsequently done uh, some more nuanced work uh, in this sort of area. So here, for example, if you have a look at the uh, equation in the pink box in the middle, this, uh, this is from some of Zara Ellingham's work. This is our prediction equation. So you can use this equation for predicting the temperature of burning using those indices to an almost 100% accuracy uh, in terms of the, the samples that we have used. However, as is always often the case, it's never quite straightforward as that. Um, and when you look at the, the work in the green box there, you can see that some of our other work has shown that soft tissue has a really important uh, role to play here. So if we are, if we have a body that's been burnt at a low intensity, then the soft tissues act as a buffer and protect the bone. Uh, and in those situations, what we see is that a slow response uh, to osteological change as a consequence of burning. However, at high temperatures, that soft tissue acts as a fuel and it increases the extent of those heat induced changes. So again, what we're seeing is not a straight correlation um, between a change in crystal structure and change in temperature, but it's again, it's a curvy linear where it starts off very slowly and then speeds up in terms of its extent of change. And then the bottom in the uh, bluish box there, this is just some work again that we've done with uh, CT. Um, and what it underlines is that not only are we seeing a shrinkage in bone as a consequence of that fusion stage because the crystal structure is reorganizing uh, itself and filling all those pores and it's shrinking, but we're also seeing a change in the volume of bone as well. So again, when we're using any sort of analysis based on volume, you have to uh, be aware that that's also changing in terms of bone. bone. So there we go. So very quick whiz through some of the sorts of methods that we might be using. Hopefully what we can see from that is that uh, we, again, the development of the methods that we're using is a, are allowing us to ask interesting questions of uh, the burnt bone. It's allowing us to link uh, the skeletal material to the conditions of burning. It's allowing us to study the bone in a non-destructive way. It's allowing us to talk a bit about diet and migration uh, as well. So these are all methods that we can use on unburnt bone as well, but it's just taken us a lot longer to develop them. Uh, partly because of that kind of the issues that I mentioned at the start. So now what I want to do just before we end is just go through a few different examples of how some of these different methods allow us to talk a bit about the context of people's lives. And it's, you know, this, this idea of a bioarchaeology of cremation has been uh, discussed in, in the burnt bone literature for a few years now. And really it's this idea that we're moving beyond just studying burnt bone and saying, oh, well, this bone was burnt at... 700 degrees or this piece of bone uh, seems to show this type of fracture pattern to commenting about what that means or how we can use that information to talk about perhaps the context of death or perhaps the um, interesting kind of uh, funerary processes that might have gone on there. Now this is very early days yet because we're still trying to fully understand the methods that we're using, but this is the direction of travel. And so if we think back to that table that we saw at the start, where we saw the development of the different approaches and philosophies to the study of burnt bone, the next column will be this. It will be about understanding what these, how we can link these changes that we're seeing in the body to that context of death or that context of life, depending. So we have some examples and hopefully that'll, that'll drive the point home. So we're gonna to go to Chile first. Uh, for a forensic example uh, by a colleague uh, over in Chile. So here what we have um, is an individual uh, who was discovered in some woods who had been burnt. Um, but beyond the, or in addition to the burning, there has been some evidence of uh, trauma as well. Now the question uh, that the forensic investigators had was, had this individual been burnt at the time of death or sometime later? We can see from the examples here that there has been decomposition and so forth going on. A period of time has passed since the body was dumped there and it was recovered. Well, we can use two things to answer that question. 
if you have a look at the uh, humerus uh, on the side there, on, on the right hand side, you can see hopefully some very thin, li white, light gray, linear scratches running along the shaft of the bone. So that is animal scavenging marks, that's gnawing from animals. Uh, and that occurs not when the bone has been burnt, but when the bone still has soft tissue on it. We can also use that uh, fracture differentiation that we mentioned earlier as well. The presence of the uh, linear and uh, rectangular grid-like fractures, some of which you can see in some of the fragmentation on the image in the, uh, in the middle there, as opposed to those U-shaped fractures here. So what we have in this particular example is an individual that has been burnt, but by understanding those heat-induced changes and the order in which they happen, we can say that this individual was burnt after the period of decomposition, so it's separate to that kind of context of death. Okay, now we're going to head over to Northumbria, which is uh, where we're living now, in the north of, uh, north of England. So, uh, running along uh, in the Roman times, running along uh, the, this, this neck of the woods from one side of our country to the other, uh, we had Hadrian's Wall, uh, which was a Roman uh, military positioning. Um, and all along that um, wall, Hadrian's Wall, were a number of military sites. Um, uh, and in those military sites, what we find are the remains of deceased individuals, often cremated. And we've got some three examples here of cremated material in the different pots that were recovered from these archaeological sites. Now, the question that we were trying to answer was not whether or not the bone had been burned, because quite clearly it has, we can see that. But if we collected material from these different sites along Hadrian's Wall, were there any consistencies in the manner in which they have been burnt? And if there has been, that might suggest that there is a consistent practice of burning or cremating the dead within the Roman military in this particular region. And so what we do is we go back to those crystallinity measures that we mentioned earlier, and we make an assumption that the values that we see uh, in all of those indices, we can relate to the conditions of burning. So we know that we can link them to temperature and intensity, uh, but we can link them to other features as well. And so we make the argument then that if there is clustering of these values together, they suggest a consistent um, cremation practice. And that's what we can see in this graph uh, here. Here we've plotted two of these particular indices uh, against each other. Uh, and we can see those in the hollow circle triangular square um, plot markers. Uh, and we can see some of our experimental data as well uh, plotted there. So what we were able to conclude then from these individuals is that along these sites, along with Hadrian's of War, there is consistency there, but the practice at those sites, although it's the same there, differs from other periods and from other locations as well. So it argues that it suggests a consistency of practice within the Roman military for the manner in which they create their debt. Now we're going to jump to Herculaneum. Now we're going to stick with the Roman period. Uh, Herculaneum, uh, I'm sure you'll have heard about uh, in Italy, is one of the sites that was destroyed when um, Vesuvius erupted. Now, the interesting thing about Herculaneum um, is that it's a little bit further away in a slightly different direction from Pompeii, which is the site everyone always thinks about. But Her Herculaneum was a port. And um, what we can see in this uh, image here is we can see lots of little arched uh, areas along the bottom, and those were boat houses. Um, so where the, you can see the grass, that used to be where the beach was. So in Herculaneum, when the volcano exploded, um, they saw it happen. They had, they had time to escape from the houses, get down to the beach and try and escape. Uh, and what we see then, uh, because they didn't escape, because you can't escape from a, a volcano. And so what we see are a number of individuals who have died on the beach and a number of individuals who have died in those arched stone boat houses that you can see there. Interestingly, those that have died on the beach tend to be men and uh, teenagers, those that have died in the boat houses tend to be women and children. And there's a thinking then that perhaps as they were trying to escape, the men uh, were trying to get the boats out of the boat houses uh, and trying to escape that way and the women and children were sheltering uh, in the boat houses. What we can see in this figure here are the outlines of some of these of six boat houses and each black dot represents uh, an individual who has died. 
what we did was we analyzed um, using the crystallinity indices, we analyzed the changes in the bone uh, crystal structure. And we combined that with an analysis of the collagen within the bone as well. And what's really interesting about this site is that we have evidence that the bone has been bone burnt and heated because of the changes in the uh, crystal structure, but we also have quite a lot of collagen preserved, which is unusual when bone is burnt. The theory is that uh, all the individuals who died at Herculaneum and at Pompeii died instantly when all the pyroclastic flow came down the hill and they were hit with this intense temperature and their soft tissues vaporized and they died on the spot. That is not what happened. And that's partly not what happened because that's just not what bodies do when they get uh, heated. But what we have in these particular examples then is uh, using this combination of methods. What we can argue is not for burning of individuals, but for individuals who are effectively baked where they were. So we think then that the rubble closed up the boat houses, uh, they were trapped inside and in essence suffocated and baked alive. And we can talk about that particularly gruesome manner of death because of our advances in those organic and inorganic uh, analyses. Which brings me on to some controversies that we've had quite recently, where some uh, Italian colleagues have analysed or been analysing uh, remains from one particular individual who, from Herculaneum, arguing that some brain residue uh, was uh, uh, preserved in amongst this. And you can see the example here uh, of, of that brain residue. This paper came out um, actually about the same time as our Herculaneum paper came out uh, earlier on in this year but they've just published a subsequent paper where they've argued that they can detect neural networks um, and the evidence of, of neurons, I should say, within these particular fragments of, of brain. Now, for us, this is a really problematic uh, study. We're not saying that this is not uh, evidence of burnt brain or preserved brain, but what we are saying is that there's not enough detail in these publications to make any consistent uh, conclusions. And the methods that they've used are perhaps not the methods that we would use. So it's really, so it's perhaps if, you're, if this is an area that you're interested in, it's probably something just to have a look at because I think there's some really uh, interesting academic discussions going on about um, the analysis of kind of preserved archaeological tissues. We're going to ju jump to Sardinia. Um, and we've got two quick examples in Sardinia. One, we're going to look at this here. This is um, from a forensic textbook uh, looking at color change um, as a consequence of burning, and we can plot and map uh, the directionality of burning uh, based on the progression of color change in bone. So we did that on this particular individual from this cave in Sardinia. Um, and we can see here uh, the cave on the right hand side, the uh, different dots represent uh, skeletal elements that we have recovered. And then on the uh, left hand side, we've got some of the results of our analyses. There are a number of individuals in there, but what we did have was one individual and through the combination of analysis of color and the analysis of the crystal changes within the bones, we were able not only to say um, that this individual was burnt and cremated, but we think that we can talk about the position of the body on that fire as well uh, in this archaeological remains. Uh, and we've kind of uh, presented that below. And I think that's interesting when we can start talking about positionality of bodies uh, on fires as well even when uh, perhaps we can't rely on the color change, but perhaps we can start thinking a bit more about that crystal structure. This is another example from Sardinia, different uh, context here, but we've included this one here because it's interesting. And you can see uh, a young female on the left-hand side, uh, and this individual was, was partially cremated, uh, which is why the bone hasn't gone fully white. But within uh, her abdomen there, what was recovered were um, fetal remains. Uh, so she was pregnant when she died and pregnant when she was cremated. And we can talk about that uh, because of our improvements in our excavation skills. And, but also we can talk about the temperature in which this uh, individual was burned through the combination of the methods that we've mentioned before. And you can see the, uh, the infant remains on the, on the right hand side. And you can see the evidence of burning on those as well. Uh, we're going to jump to somewhere entirely fictional now, um, and Game of Thrones and the Winterfell. And um, I'm going to talk about this, if you're familiar with your Game of Thrones and the final season of Game of Thrones. Uh, if not, this will mean nothing to you. Um, what we're going to have a think about here is about body mass. There's a lot of interest in studying um, the weight of uh, skeletal remains, burnt skeletal remains, and seeing if we can link that to individuals, male or female, or multiple individuals, depending on the weight. It's a really problematic thing to do. 
because um, it relies on you having recovered all of the bone fragments when you're making your uh, assessments, but also there's a huge amount of overlap between individuals and sexes and ages. This figure that we can see in front of us is from a piece of work that we did a while ago where we were trying to link the body mass uh, from cremated material <clears throat> with, uh, so the weight of cremated material with body mass from different populations to see if there was some sort of correlation. If you had a population with a very large body mass, would you therefore expect heavy, uh, heavier amounts of uh, cremated skeletal material. And you can see from these figures that no, that is not actually the case. We do not see these really strong links between the two, which again makes these sorts of interpretations problematic. But I bring us to Winterfell because of something that annoyed me at the end of that uh, series where there was a huge battle, lots of people died, and they burned all these individuals on the pyres. And I think what interested me looking at that particular scene from the TV program was just what did they do with all that burnt bone? And because of the way that uh, I am, we did the maths. Uh, and so we kind of calculated that we knew what the army was, we assumed that half of them died, and then we used averages from the literature um, in terms of bone weight to make some calculation. And yeah, based on our calculations, uh, we came to the conclusion that there's about 135,000 kilograms of burnt bone to be processed. And that made us think about where that would go and who would deal with that and what would, what would happen. It's one of those things where TV just doesn't think about the implications of what it's talking about. Okay, final example to bring all of this together into our uh, archaeology of cremation. We're going to Brazil this time. So uh, we were looking at a particular context in the southern highlands of Brazil, and we can see some of the burnt material there uh, inside this particular excavation in the ground there. There's a lot of text on this slide. I'm doing exactly the thing I, I tell my students not to do. I can only apologize. So, the interesting thing about this particular context is, apart from the fact it's, it's not very well studied, is that we also have not only a very rich um, osteological evidence, very rich archaeological evidence, but have a really interesting uh, histographic uh, collection of data as well. So we have the written records uh, from the uh, colonizers that were invading this particular area. We have the cremations in these particular landscapes. We have um, the archaeological evidence and artifacts that go with this as well. But for this particular population, which is uh, one of the indigenous populations, we still have the descendants of these individuals. So we have an oral history of what happened there as well. And so what we were able to do was combine the hist uh, um, the historic evidence, the archaeological evidence, the ethnographic evidence, and the scientific evidence that we had collected from the uh, skeletal remains to make the conclusions about this particular population at the bottom. And it gives us this really nuanced, holistic, rounded understanding of this uh, particular population in the way that we couldn't do with any just with any one branch of that evidence on its own. And certainly we couldn't do with just looking at the skeletal evidence alone. So it's that combination um, of evidence types that I think is taking us forward and allowing us to think a little bit more about the uh, broader kind of cultural and social significance uh, of, of cremation and how that fits within those populations, but looking at the bodies themselves. And that, by doing that, that's going to take us towards our archaeology of cremation. And that is where I'm going to end the talk in a very quick uh, with through some of the issues and interesting things about bird bone. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim, for uh, being a wonderful session and explaining the things in a way that uh, can be easily grasped by the audience. We are in the virtual space. So if any uh, participant have any query, they can type the questions or they can raise the question hand if they want to interact with Tim related to any question or any query. There is a one question from Dr. Jagdish. Uh, how can you correlate and assess heat induced changes on a tooth? Ah, okay. That's a really good question. Um, teeth generally show the same amount, the same sorts of change uh, as bone. It goes through color change, it fractures. Um, the Reality is though, people don't study cremated teeth because they, they do tend to fracture and fragment and they're harder to study. So although we think that they are um, showing some of the same changes, people haven't looked at things like the crystal structure and those sorts of changes. So that's still some work to be done there. 
people have looked at it for stable isotopes and, and, and have concluded that it's not a great source of stable isotope because it fragments so much. If any other participant have any query? Okay. I think uh, uh, there is a one question. If, if you can uh, read, I think it is in uh, some different language, maybe Spanish or French. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's Italian. It's Italian. Italian yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you type well, a question in English? And uh, in the meantime, we can take the next question. Can you please throw some light on stabilization of bond remains? Yes. Um, so there have been a number of studies where people have, have attempted to find the best way of stabilizing uh, burnt bone uh, so that you can do subsequent analysis. Usually, the methods involve some sort of um, dilution of glue um, in which you can then spray on the bone and stick them together. For me, that's really problematic because it's a very uh, it's a very challenging thing uh, to do. If you're thinking about look, looking at histological sectioning, you can just stabilize it the way that you would stabilize any form of uh, hard or soft tissue. You just have to be a bit more careful and delicate when you do it. If you're thinking about reconstruction, then my preference would be actually to use 3D scanning uh, and reconstruct it that way, as opposed to try and do it by hand because it's quite, it's quite difficult then. So there's no, um, there's no one conclusion. There's no one way of doing it. People are still talking about the best way. So I think we are coming to the end of the session. Thank you for the wonderful session. And uh, I request to kindly accept that uh, certificate of appreciation from the Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. Me, along with uh, my co-host, Dr. Pooja Chakravarti, kindly accept this certificate for delivering a wonderful session. Thank you very much, yes. So, I would like to thank my dedicated team member, those who are reaching to the several platform and uh, giving opportunity to interact more and more people. I would like to thank him again for taking out the session. These are my team members. We have a list of huge list of team members. So here, I thank you all my team member. And I thank you once again, uh, Tim Thompson for taking out the session. If any participant have any query, you can connect with the Tim on the LinkedIn. With this, I think uh, we uh, come to the end. I will request Dr. Pooja Chakravarti to uh, to give a vote of thanks to Tim Thompson for delivering a wonderful session. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful topic. In fact, this was one of the most wonderful topics that we were looking forward to. And you have just covered it so beautifully for us. Thanks a lot for taking out, taking out a valuable time. And we are especially grateful to our audience for being there with us and to 